Hey everybody, I'm at my conference, National Communication Association, Salt Lake City. So, thank you for watching this video. I wanted to talk for just a couple of minutes about the reading we had assigned for today, which is the uh, pranking rhetoric piece. So this piece, as you can see on the screen, was written by Christine Harold and was published in Critical Studies in Media Communication. So pranking rhetoric is a form of activism in which activists work to prank corporations in order to support social justice issues or things like non-smoking. Okay, so if you pull up the article, you can see a couple of key concepts that come from it. So uh, I'm not going to go over everything, but I did want to point out a few things you, you should take note of. So one thing that's mentioned early in Harold's piece is uh, about the organization Adbusters. So Adbusters does a form of pranking that's a little bit different from what she is discussing throughout the rest of the piece. So in 2003, Adbusters used a campaign against Nike in order to show some of the really bad things that they were doing at the time, such as using sweatshops. So it starts with that as kind of an introduction to the concept of culture jamming or pranking rhetoric. Okay, so as you can see, I don't really have anything highlighted here, but just know the first couple of pages give examples of early forms of culture jamming. If you go to page four of the PDF, uh, Harold talks about the idea of parody and how this plays an important role in certain types of, um, not necessarily activism, but different types of ways that organizations in the past have worked against corporations. Okay, so page four, it states, and definitely read everything before this, but it states, in other words, Parity becomes one of many social codes, codes that are as available to the capitalists as they are to the artists, and as such finds itself without vocation, as a rhetoric of protest in late capitalism. It's important to know how Harold is discussing parity here because she will propose that culture jamming is different from parity. Okay? Jumping down a little bit to the, uh, the other yellow highlighted piece, it states, hence parody as negative critique is not up to the task of undermining the parodist's own purchase of the truth, as it maintains both the hierarchy of language and the protester's role as revealer. Parody derives the content of, of what it sees as oppressive rhetoric, but fails to attend to its patterns. Next, Christine Harold talks about what she means by the concept of uh, pranking rhetoric or culture jamming. She uses those two terms interchangeably. So she states in blue, in this essay, I explore the rhetorical strategies of an alternative sort of culture jammer, the prankster who resists less through negating and opposing dominant rhetorics than by playfully and provocatively folding existing cultural forms in on themselves, okay? So they're not really using parody in these forms of activism. They're more taking a appropriation approach, all right? And in this piece, and I'm kind of going to jump to her three examples, she talked about how three different organizations use this culture jamming approach. One of them, in particular, addressed a gender issue. And this is why you're reading this piece for this class. All right? So, jumping down a little bit. So, here's page five. Page five basically just has a background on what different interpretations of jamming meant. Okay, so I'm on page six now, and it states in the middle of this page, 
Finally, and most crucial for the discussion of pranking that follows, whereas parody may have significant impact in certain rhetorical situations, it should not be seen as a trans-historical category that is inherently subversive, primarily because capitalism itself is not a trans-historical system. It is constantly taking new shapes and producing different kind of effects. So, although parody is not always subversive, so like if you were watching a parody on YouTube, it's not necessarily pushing back against some institution, um, she's kind of saying like, this is why I can't, she can't fully use parody within this argument. And so, um, with culture jamming, it uses a lot more appropriation. It uses a lot more of using aspects of the corporations to fight against them. So I'm going to jump down. Uh, yeah, there's discussion of media pranksters on page seven and all of her examples are related to the media and how it um, promotes their activism. Okay, so I'm jumping down. Um, before I get to my three examples, I wanted to give one older example of how individual artists can serve as or could have served as culture jamming. Uh, artists. So on page seven, at the bottom of the page, and this is going to lead really nicely into our first example. On page seven, it states in yellow, whereas parodists attempt to change things in the name of a presupposed value, comedians diagnose a specific situation and try something to see what responses they can provoke. Next, she gives the uh, scenario of one culture jammer named Joey Skaggs. Skaggs became famous because in the 70s, he did a prank where he pretended that there was a new establishment called the Cat House for Dogs. Cat House is another term for brothel or a place of prostitution. So he jammed the media by using the idea that there would be a dog brothel. And as you see in these two highlighted sections, this is kind of what he did. Um, so it's not as important to know that it was called an image event, just for our purposes, view it as culture jamming. Um, if I were in class with you, I would go over these next couple of paragraphs on page eight. So just look to see what Joey Skaggs did because it was kind of showing how news media in the 70s were very sensationalized. So instead of focusing on important issues, news media would turn to something that seems most outrageous. That's why he knew this idea of a cat house for dogs would become really big news within New York at the time. All right, so and here's another example here from Joey Skaggs. Okay, so jumping down, uh, we're on page nine of the PDF now. So this section I haven't read, this basically just gives another explanation of what she means by media pranking. So you can take a look at that. She uses the idea that uh, pranksters fold culture in on themselves. So she's explaining that in more detail. Okay, so, and I'm gonna skip this. She does another comparison to what jamming means in the context of music, like a, like a jam session. Okay, so starting on page 11, Christine Harold goes over her three examples of culture jamming that used media to kind of um, work as activism against corporations. The first organization, and please pay attention to this one, is called the Barbie Liberation Organization. So I want you to read this in detail on your own. It pretty much explains itself. 
but I'm now going to show you a news clip from 1991 that talked about this activist stunt. So let's take a look. Okay, and this is this video clip is three minutes and thirty nine seconds. Operation organization targeted toy stores. Hi, I'm King Talk Barbie, the spokes doll for the PLO. We're an international group of children's toys that are revolting against the companies that made us. She's the absolute and for millions of little girls, the Barbie doll. From her ever-changing wardrobe to her constantly hip hairdos, Barbie has always been ahead of her time. But as George Chikarone reports, some people think Barbie needs to be liberated. She's clean in the car. No doubt this is the scene in many living rooms just after Christmas. But teen talk Barbie may be breathing in too many fumes because she's starting to sound a lot like G.I. Joe. Aside from this bleach blonde she-man, there are a couple of poor Joes turning up out there who got short-ended on their share of testosterone. Wanna go shopping? Do you wanna sleep over tonight? I wonder two things. I wonder if by accident at the Mattel factory that the uh, wrong doll parts got into the Barbie, and if number two, someone did it just out of getting even with somebody, I think it's also kind of sick. So what's a little voice swapping between dolls, you might ask? Well, apparently this he said, she said mystery may not be so innocent. Hi, I'm Teen Talk Barbie, the spokes doll for the B-L-O. That stands for the Barbie Liberation Organization. We're an international group of children's toys that are revolting against the companies that made us. This little-known faction of underground toy terrorists is waging a video war, claiming responsibility for the sex change operations. Their mission? To wipe out gender stereotypes. Though we can't have a totally new voice, we can switch with G.I. Joe and other toys for boys. Now we say things like this. Dead men tell no tales. <laughs> I donated my voice to a G.I. Joe, because they want to be free, too. They don't want to say all that violent war stuff. Now he says what I used to say. I love school, don't you? Let's sing with the band tonight. The BLO says it performed corrective surgery on 300 dolls and then put them back on the shelves in at least two states. Zach Zellin received his G.I. Joe Christmas morning. What's cool about G.I. Joe? He fights. Say it ain't so, Joe. This G.I. is a lover, not a fighter, and that's okay with Zack. I also like him because this kind is not as violent. My first reaction was to laugh. You know, I, I did see the humor of it. But, um, but I very quickly began to, uh, I drew back from it. Joanne Oppenheim has been chronicling toy trends for almost ten years. It is sort of a terrorist act directed against children, and that did not seem appropriate. It seemed like a cheap shot. I like it because it isn't so violent. It makes it more funny. It sounds like the babes in Toyland are growing up a little too fast. But if you ask the experts, it was inevitable. We always knew that if Barbie began to speak, she'd put her foot in her mouth, and she sure did. Mattel, the company that makes Barbie, had no comment. Okay, so you just saw that video, and that gives a good summary of what happened with the Barbie Liberation Organization. So um, Christine Harrell also gives her own explanation of what happened. And if you turn to the passage in blue, this is one common outcome that took place that year. It states, when children open their toys on Christmas morning, instead of Barbie chirpily cheerfully or chirping cheerful affirmations of american girlishness she growled in the butch voice of gi joe eat lead cobra and dead men tell no lies and vengeance is mine meanwhile joe exclaimed 
let's plan our dream wedding in Barbie's voice. So they were using this culture jamming event in order to show the gender norms that are taught to children via toys. So yeah, and um, continuing on, it got a lot of news coverage. People from the BLO did interviews with things like NPR, National Public Radio. And so um, on the back of each Barbie doll and GI, GI Joe were stickers that said, please contact the media, okay? So they wanted, or call your local TV news. So they wanted the parents to contact the news to kind of spread uh, this activist message. So basically, the reason why this ties into media activism is the use of the media to spread information about what was going on. So yeah, I think it's really interesting. It also provides one approach if you would like to do your own activism in the future. And this is um, one reason they were able to do this and not get in trouble for copyright is because they set up their own corporation. I think it's pronounced Arkmark. And so this organization, as you see described here, provided cover so that the individual members of the BLO would not be sued. So yeah, that's one form of culture jamming. Uh, I'm gonna just briefly mention the other two ones. You should read this on your own. Starting on page 13, we have the Biotic Baking Brigade. So the whole way that they used culture jamming was they, uh, the members of this brigade or the BBB would attend events where like some really well-known speaker or economist or corporate person was there like talking about whatever the issue was. And they would then put a pie in the face of that person. And it sounds kind of silly, but they would target specific people who promoted messages they thought were damaging the country. So for example, uh, economist Milton Friedman was one of their first targets. They've also targeted people like Bill Gates, who is the founder of Microsoft. So they would go and do this, and I'm not sure if they're still doing these culture jams, but they made sure, and you'll see this on page 14, they made sure to have their own camera crews there to film that event. And that way they would already have the video to send to news media. So this is another example of culture jamming. And the third example uh, that, that uh, Harold covers begins on page 16 of the PDF this was the Infect Truth campaign, okay? So they were culture jamming against big tobacco. Um, back in the mid-2000s, there were all these ads where it was like like black background and yellow uh, text talking about the truth about big tobacco. So please read over this. Uh, all of this is pretty useful, but... Whereas in the past, anti-smoking campaigns were actually kind of still trying to make smoking sound cool. Like in the 90s, there was a thing where it was like, tobacco is wacko. And that was intentionally done to actually get kids to keep smoking. But in fact, Truth was doing a different approach. On page 17 in blue, you see it states, in contrast, the Truth campaign does not just tell kids not to smoke. In fact, finger-waving messages never appear in its literature or imagery, or imagery at all. Instead, truth encourages young people to become culture jammers or pranksters themselves, and even, for, even provides them with the tools to do it. The truth campaign is successful because it maximizes the truism in corporate and contemporary marketing. Kids want to feel like they are sticking it to the man, even if the man provides them the tools 
with which to do so. So that's basically what they did. And on the next page, you see some different examples of what they did. So in fact, Truth would have these ads within magazines and then instruct teens to like open the magazine in whatever store they're in, okay? So this is just a third example of culture jamming. Another thing they did was they would have magazines that would have thought bubbles, as you see here in this image. And they would encourage teens to put these stickers on like pro smoking ads and the kids could write in whatever message they wanted so and it states here on page 19 in yellow the content of truth's campaign rhetoric is not fundamentally different from the ad buster strategy of negative critique what differentiates what differentiates the two is the form of their rhetorical strategy Unlike the magazine's Joe Camel parody, Joe Chemo, which critiques cigarette smoking and the ads that promote it, Truth unabashedly appropriates the rhetorical tropes of branding. It taps into the language of the market. Its signature color orange, its use of white asterisk pop-ups to connote a virus spreading, and its digital font are consistent in its magazine, television, and internet campaigns. In effect, Truth is an excellent example of good brand management. So these three examples I went over, the Barbie Liberation Organization, uh, the um, Infect Truth, and the Biotic Baking Brigade, all three of these serve as different forms of culture jamming. But if you return to the Barbie one, I'm just scrolling up here, the Barbie Liberation Organization, this is the one that directly connects to how culture jamming can tie into gender. Okay, and so before I have you uh, finish this video, I wanna direct your attention to four different contemporary organizations that do forms of culture jamming, okay? And all of these have websites. These are different forms of arts activism. I want you to check out these websites to see what they did, okay? Force, Upsetting Rape Culture, is based in Maryland. They have an office in Baltimore, and they recently did the Clothesline Project on College Park's campus. So they continue to do various forms of culture jamming. Uh, their website, which I'm clicking on here, looks like this. It's coming up. Um, and they, if you're interested in getting involved, they constantly have events happen in Baltimore if you're able to get there. And usually they promote their events on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, you can check it out. If you're not on Facebook, you can always go to their website, okay? Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, or I guess that was on November 4th, they had a hike for healing, for example. The second organization is actually a solo artist, is Banksy. He created a walled-off hotel, which is right between the Israel-Palestinian dividing line. So this hotel is a form of culture jamming and it's a working hotel. And it's pretty interesting to read how this functions as an activist art. The third example is Guerrilla Girls. And this is one of the more prominent activist groups with feminism. Let me just copy and paste that. So Guerrilla Girls has been around for close to three decades at this point. I'm just pulling this up. All the members of Guerrilla Girls wear Guerrilla masks 
So they have gorilla masks on anytime they're out doing their activism. So their website is here. So here's an example of three of their members. Okay, and it says here, Gorilla Girls reinventing the F word feminism. So check this out. This is really interesting. They're all artists. They continue to have activities and activist events across the country and the world, actually. And finally, this last website is the Center for Artistic Activism. This is just another organization that kind of gives resources for activist artists, okay? Um, I'll go back to the Banksy. Excuse me just a moment. Okay, so the Center for Artistic Activism, I guess they may have, if you need a shorter abbreviation of the website, it's C for the number four aa.org okay and they just have different resources for arts activists so yeah it's pretty cool okay and with that i'm gonna return to force uh so yeah please check out these websites and make sure you've read the christine herald piece I just gave you a brief overview of what all is included in this article. And after our critical dialogues on Monday, November 12th, I can talk for a couple of minutes about other ideas from the Herald piece and answer any questions you may have had. And yeah, if you have a chance to check out these websites, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay. All right. So I hope to see you all tomorrow in class. Thank you.